right, this is John Cola with GrowingYourDreams.com. We have another exciting episode for him here in Los Angeles, just in a standard residential area. And what I don't want you guys to do is if you guys have a residential house, I don't want you guys to have a lawn. Look at this. R lawn, 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 lawn. Lawn uses lots of resources, especially here in Los Angeles where there's a water crunch, you know, and there's, well, there's no drought now, but previous years there's been drought and people are using lots of water to water their lawn, which provides them no food because most people are not eating their grass. You could eat your grass, but most people don't eat their grass. So in this episode, I want to show you guys a home that actually started a micro farm that is flipping that on its butt because it's basically catching through 10,000 gallons of water storage, water catchment. They're using that water to basically grow food for 45 families in the area on a local CSA. So let's swing the camera around and show you guys across the street, literally, where this farm are using terraponics, which is like hydroponics, but in soil, to grow food for 45 families and use the rainwater as a primary water they are using to grow all this amazing food here in Los Angeles. So this is the Dignan micro farm and this is a crop swap LA project. This is actually their third micro farm and a micro farm is basically a small farm, not like a giant big conglomerate farm, but a local farm locally owned. Actually, this is owned by the CropSwapLA.org. They are a non-profit organization that's mission is to basically make food more available. All the food you guys see here grown is being distributed only within people that live within one mile. They're not selling to people that live further away. Their goal is to have many micro farms around the city to provide people with food like they are doing here. So this is their third model. They're the next fourth uh, micro farm will actually be at a local high school. We're gonna, they're gonna start training the young youth in the area to grow food as well and do vocational training with them. In addition, they also take people and teach them how to grow food as well as people that wanna come in and learn how to start their own little micro farm on their property as well. And you can see here, they have a food water power because they incorporate the food because we all need to eat. Second, they incorporate the water because they have water storage where they can hold up to 10,000 gallons of rainwater below the ground in tanks and use that water to grow the food. So it's saving water compared to standard agriculture. Number three, they're also using solar power and collecting the sun's energy to power some of the pumps uh, to keep this farm running. One of the main things important for me for a micro farm is that all this food is being served locally, right? One of the things that's really important is people don't realize when you go to the store and buy food, it's harvested and picked and then put in hydro coolers and put in refrigeration trucks, shipped to your local store, and by the time you buy the food, it could be a week, two weeks, three weeks, or even months old in the case of apples. Whereas with the farm here, they're basically literally picking it to you and then distributing it to the local people so you have higher quality and a more nutrient-dense food to make a bigger difference in the local community's health. In addition, besides all the vegetables they grow here, Crop Swap LA also collects unwanted food from local neighbors in the LA area that have fruit trees that are, would otherwise go uneaten. So then they collect all the different fruits from local neighbors, add that in with the vegetables that they grow here, and then they'll sell that to you guys in a CSA. So when you join the CSA, you're gonna basically pay a quarter of the price you would for equivalent organically grown produce if you had to buy it at the store. So it's a lot more economical. And even more so, if you are on the you know CalFresh program, which is a like a food stamp thing, then you pay even half price over um, what a normal CSA member would pay. In addition, they are also, um, they have a waiting list because there was more people that want food. So, you know, there needs to be more farms like this and more people could grow food to supply the waiting list uh, with food, but they are prioritizing, you know, certain categories of people like the elderly, for example, they'll, they'll move those up, uh, you know, in first place because it's very important for the elderly uh, you know, to get all this nutrient dense food that may even help reverse diseases when you start changing your diet and start eating healthier. 
So in this episode, what I hope to do is actually take you guys around the farm to show you guys actually how they're growing all this food, show you guys some of the amazing food they're growing, and of course at the end, we're gonna go ahead and interview the man that started it all, and you're gonna learn more about his mission to make a difference in the food system here in Los Angeles. All right, so believe it or not, to me, this farm really starts in the backyard because that's where they're catching 5,000 gallons of water, right? Right when they started this farm, that's when they had the heavy rains in California that were flooding some cities here in California. All that water got caught into, into their basically catchment system that is holding the water. So I want to show you guys that first because you know to grow crops, it takes water and this is the most sustainable farm I've seen because it's catching the most water that I've ever seen, especially here in a residential neighborhood. I mean, you guys could set up some kind of your own water catchment. I mean, I catch water for sure. I might catch 100 gallons. Man, he's got 5,000 gallons here in the backyard and throughout all the front yard with all the tanks, he has another 5,000 gallons. So let's show you guys this $5,000 tank in the back. Look at this. You can't even see the tank in the back. It's not some big, huge plastic thing. It's not this big thing you might see in a farm. The tank is literally underneath this patio, these flagstones that I'm stepping on. It's a really nice hangout area for the family and for the staff members when they have meetings. And then also the water from underneath powers this amazing fountain, which brings some tranquility <laughs> to the space and also some edible plants around it. And you can see, I mean, this is the access point uh, for underneath. If we lift this up, you guys can see there's some pipes and some pumps and whatnot in there. But what happens is all the water that is off the roof of the garage gets funneled down. It gets filtered right here with this little filter. And then the water runs down into the tank down below. Likewise, they have catchment off the roof of the house that also comes down, gets filtered, and then goes down in the tank below. Another big problem with California and many residential areas that are developed is the runoff. We want to prevent the runoff. The runoff water hits the ground, it hits the sidewalks, and then it basically goes in, and then basically it goes down the sewer, and in big rain events, the sewers clog up, and then the streets flood, and then you drive your car through the street, and then your, your, your car is kaput because the car gets wet. We need to have permeable services so it lets the water flow down into the ground and then allows the ground to capture it. And actually that's what they've done in this very backyard. You can see, but John, there's stones. How do they catch water? Let me show you guys. So we got a, a bucket right here, right? We're gonna go over to the waterfall. That is, once again, this is all the rainwater that they're recirculating. We're gonna catch this in a bucket, a little kid bucket. We're gonna take this bucket and we're gonna go over here and we're gonna pour it in between these flagstones into these rocks. Look at that, is the water pooling? Is it running away? No, it's being absorbed in. These rocks are basically glued in place with some expensive glue so they don't ever go away. But this is basically the water just running down below and then getting re-caught and then reused. What if they had sidewalks made just like this all over the country and this was the default sidewalk that would then allow the water to flow into the ground instead of run away and then end up in the ocean bringing oil and dirt and pollutants when the water flows away washing all the toxins in the street. This is an amazing concept and this is just one of the many cool things they're doing here at the farm. All right, so keeping on the whole theme of the water, right? They are using water in the most efficient way and they are using terraponics, which is basically like hydroponic growing, but they're using the soil in with the growing medium that they include things like rock dust to basically bring the nutrient levels up in the plants. And they basically recirculate all the water so there's very little loss of water from evaporation. There might be a little bit of water loss from the transpiration, which is basically if a dog pants, that's how it cools itself down. The plants transpire water to keep themselves cool while they are pulling up nutrients into the plants. The main feature in the front yard, which some of you guys may love for a front yard, some of you guys may hate, is this big structure here that's over seven feet tall. This is basically like 30 feet run of, I mean, basically, 
rain gutters that they've outfitted to uh, you know grow the vegetables in this big tall system. I mean, this makes a huge statement. You guys saw it from afar when I was across the street. What do you guys think of this tower system in the front yard? Like me personally, I personally wouldn't put it in my front yard, but it definitely literally stops traffic as we saw people driving here when we're filming this video they stop get out of their car look at that and they're thinking and scratching their head how do i get some of them collard greens because that's what they wanted right i mean it makes a statement and uh, i'm glad that the city allows this because some cities if you put this in your city you'd probably get a ticket they'd probably come and remove it after some time after they tried to force you to remove it you know i, I definitely think that this area here where they just have more standard looking garden beds personally is a lot more aesthetically acceptable but of course i also hope that cities pass laws and ordinances so that people could do what they want on their property especially when it comes to growing food in you know in, in a lot of cities that have food deserts and food scarcity of healthy food for the local people so there's basically yeah 24 of these that are 30 feet long and this produces the majority of the food here in their front yard. Terrapotics, where they're basically recycling the water, uh, very efficient use of the water. So let's go ahead and look at some of the crops that they're growing right now in this vertical system to maximize their growing space in this small residential lot. All right, so this is a good overview shot so you guys can see all the different uh, troughs that they're growing and all the different foods. So I'm gonna go up to each one and shoot the guys all the different crops they're growing currently. We are here in September. All right, from bottom to top, they got some squashes, they got some uh, peppers and onions, and they got some peppers up top. The next one, they got uh, peppers, eggplants, eggplants and peppers. I really love that they're growing a lot of the purple colored peppers are more nutritious as are the eggplants i want you guys to incorporate lots of purple foods into your diet they're really nutritious due to the anthocyanin content uh, these ones were just planted out looks like this one's got some uh, baby lettuce starts the bottom one is not yet to be planted we got some more lettuce here and more lettuce here that are going to be uh, coming up really soon up here they got some really nice lettuce and i like that they're actually growing the red colored lettuce versus the green lettuce more nutritious and of course one of my favorite leafy greens is the purple or red bok choy they got lots of this stuff this makes amazing greens to add to your salad they also have the amaranth growing here more of the red bok choy here and actually also here up on the top up over here they got flat leaf parsley they got more flat leaf parsley they got some tot soy here and here over to this side we looks like we got some nice uh, collard greens right here look at these nice collard greens right here more collard greens here we got some red russian kale more red russian kale and from that side looks like they're replanting the top two and then the bottom two actually have lots of dinosaur kale and to me it looks like they're under harvesting their dino kale because there's a lot more they should be harvesting because in a farm situation you shouldn't really ever have bottom leaves that are turning uh, yellow if they are that means you're not harvesting them fast enough now of course they're trying to maximize their space here so even along the house they're basically planting in uh, big pots and they're planting the trees these are also using the same uh, growing method the terraponics so i'm quite curious to see how the terraponics will work with trees. Generally, terraponics works really good, or aquaponics would work really good with vegetables, but not necessarily trees. For me personally, I would put trees like in big containers and just basically feed it some water, let them fully dry out. So there could be a lot more fungal growth in there, but you know, this is a newer farm, so we'll see how these plants do in the long run. This is all, you know, using the same water tanks down below where they catch the rainwater as well and then this brings us to their boxes now while these are like raised boxes here once again they're using the same uh growing principles as the troughs but they're a lot bigger so these are known as the root boxes where they fill a considerable amount of soil in the boxes and then a little bit of a uh, gravel at the bottom so they could grow deep root vegetables whether that's carrots this time of year they're currently growing the sweet potatoes 
And these sweet potatoes are really got some really nice growth, guys. These are growing great. While they are growing specifically for the sweet potatoes, the tubers that are normally eaten, I would also encourage them to harvest the tops. The greens are also edible. You can sell them as big bunches. I saw them at the farmer's market this morning in Torrance. Um, you can eat them raw. You could also cook with them. They are delicious greens to eat. And even if they took it to the next level, they could grow the uh, purple sweet potato leaves that are purple that are even more nutritious than the green ones. Over here in these boxes, they got the okra, and I love the okra. I'm also growing okra in my yard. These okras, to me, are growing a little bit tall and lanky. That being said, they're still producing really nice okra pods. And of course, you know what the yeah. almost fall-like weather here in Southern California. It's been basically foggy a lot of mornings. So some of their squash plants in this area are definitely getting the PM. <laughs> that means powdery mildew. So I'm sure they'll be uh, you know, trying to deal with that or replace it as needed. So along the outside border of the farm here, they got a concrete block wall, which on top they once again built their same boxes that are lined on the inside. So the water is kept inside the enclosed system and is reused uh, through a flood and drain system in this section. And I really love how they have our herbs along the outside. This really gets people to stop. We saw some people stop earlier and then they're taking this and they're smelling this. And this is like the Thai basil. It's one of my favorites. Looks like they should be topping this a bit more. When it gets the flower, they should have already topped this in my personal opinion. So they could just come here and just mass top it and make little bunches for people, their CSA members. If we continue further down, you can see they're planting things like uh, celery down in this area. I really like how they have some like low growing kind of uh, stuff and it really kind of gets people invited. You know, I would try to grow things that people like know what's on the edge. Oh, like over here, they got a whole mixture of uh, these are edible flowers as well as the sorrel in the front. So I like that a lot. Looks really nice. And coming further over, we got some thyme and some other probably oregano growing. That's uh, definitely, um, they just planted out. You guys can see from the front now, this is the other side of the sweet potatoes where you're just really kicking some butt. The sweet potatoes are the plants that I think are growing the best in the front yard personally. They're really just taking over. They got some sage here, which will be interesting to see how it does in the long run because my sage plant can get quite big. And they got the entrance they have roped off because this is a private residence after all. Then over here, they got more oregano planted, more developed oregano, so that's really nice. Although this can be probably a bit more difficult to harvest. And then back in the front over on this side, maybe for privacy, they got some really nice celery, guys. Look at this celery down if we come down here. It's got some nice stalks for sure. But once again, for me, this looks like they're under harvesting this because they should be coming by and picking out all the nice large celery stalks, maybe making bundles of celery stalks or even just topping off whole plants and then putting it in the bundles. As you guys can see over here, they built a nice uh, trellis structure system and they're growing lots of things up their trellis so let's check it out. So I want to show you guys actually how you guys can maximize the use of your space whether you have a micro farm or whether you're growing at home and we want to use the vertical space because you may be limited on the amount of physical square foot you have but you can grow as high as you want so they put up these trellises so they can grow things really tall up it and in this case they're growing the three sisters they got the corn here they got the beans here and they got the squash here. So the three sisters, each one of the sisters support themselves so the, the corn could grow up. Uh, the beans are gonna kinda grow up the corn and the squash is gonna produce lots of squash. <laughs> and then I wanna show you guys down over here how this system works. So how this system works is it, in below each one of these uh, growing troughs, they have a tank. This is what collects some of the rainwater. And if we just lift this up, I can show you guys what it looks like in there. This is basically all the rainwater. They are they add organic nutrients to as well as some molasses. And this is what basically keeps everything fed. They're also aerating this as well so that it doesn't smell it doesn't uh, smell foul or get gross, okay? So this is a they call it a terraponics system. Over on this side, they actually got some tomatoes, and to me, the tomatoes are not looking too hot. <laughs> Although they have lots of tomatoes on here, uh, looks like you know we're getting a lot of like uh, top growth. Looks like they maybe need a little bit more nutrition in their 
um, you know, tanks that hold all the water and nutrients to me personally, but I don't do hydroponic or even terraponics myself. All right, so over here, this is probably one of the last two beds here. They basically are just growing some, looks like they got bush beans growing. They just planted them not so long ago. So, I mean, that's pretty much the quick tour of this yard, how they're growing it through using terraponics, using the rainwater catchment. So this could be more sustainable than traditional farming. Also, it's hyper local, guys. That's the main thing. They only distribute within people within one mile. So I think that's amazing. Just this one space could feed 45 families in the local area. There definitely needs to be more micro farms like this one. So the last part of this episode, we're gonna go ahead and interview uh, Jemaya Hargens about the Crop Swap LA organization and why he decided literally to put a micro farm in his front yard. So now the pleasure of introducing you guys to Jemaya Hargens, the founder of Crop Swap LA that actually made this micro farm possible. And actually this is his third one going on. So this man is doing some incredible work here in Los Angeles to make a difference, a small, very small difference in the food system, but hopefully in the future, he gets bigger and bigger and has one of these on every single city block yes. in Los Angeles and even beyond Los Angeles out there. He's gonna hopefully franchise it one day. He's got some big plans, guys. I've talked to him off camera for like a good amount of time. <laughs> Anyways, why did you decide to start this Crop Swap LA and put in these micro farms to feed the local community. <laughs> well, I started Crop Swap LA when my first daughter was born. I thought about the food in the city, and I said, going around being as busy as I am, inevitably, I would have to give her something fast food one day. And I wanted to prevent that by having as much food supply as I could possibly have that would end up being in her body. So I started a little garden in my backyard, and then I invited other gardeners over to swap our crops. It was something fun and monthly, just for fun, but it ended up being such a cornucopia of food that I then made it official. And flash forward to 2018 and 2020, that's when we started our first micro farm. That's the idea that yes, there's a lot of food out there already, but let's be intentional and grow food from the start and find a way to distribute it in a logical way. Cool, and then how did you grow from one to two and now this is your third location? That's right. Our third location now has 45 families being fed from it. The first two had about 30 and now we're serving more than 70 families every single Sunday. It's amazing. Families pay on a monthly basis for the CSA to guarantee they get a portion of whatever is available and our fruit tree pickers go around LA to find the essential food in people's backyards like oranges, grapes, limes, lemons, and various others, and include those in the bags. Wow, amazing. So how is this impacting the community? I mean, is this a food desert or is food hard to grow? I mean, why is, why is there local food that you guys are growing and offering to people here in the local, you know, one mile radius area, so much more beneficial than just going to the local big grocery store? Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Los Angeles, there are more than 20,000 people per square mile which means a lot of folks are relying upon the same grocery store. It's a precarious situation, it's dangerous in terms of sustainability, and really that system needs to be decentralized. Plus, when we grow our own food, there's a bunch of variety available, there's a lot of community connectivity available, and we own the food, so it's food independence. Really, that's what Crop Swap LA is about. Wonderful, and I know you're growing some specific crops for the local community, like crops they would like, like the okra and collard greens. Do you want to say why that's important? Maybe some big local grocery stores may not offer the exact crops that maybe some of the people in the local area grew up with, for example. So true. That is so true. In fact, what right behind us, so true. In fact, right behind us, there's okra that's eight feet tall. There are corn that is indigenous with 20% greater protein than regular white and yellow corn and there's a variety of seasonal foods that our bodies respond to positively depending on the time of the year. So we have that ability to cater what we grow to the people in the community. Uh, we also have the right to use the environment intelligently. We capture rainwater here and use that as our sole source. Uh, we also have city water hookups in a drought, but for the most part, we've been able to keep up with the 10,000 gallons of water that's up here on this property. So we are really grateful to continue growing food in that manner. Wonderful. So another thing that's very important to me is nu the nutrient density of food. 
and you know why is nutrient density and growing nutrient density important but more importantly getting these nutrient dense plants out to the community that's right well nutrient density is key to what we do we use all vegan plant-based fertilizer here this terraponics hydroponics setup that means we feed it weekly and we know that the organic materials in there came from plants that then augments the flavor and the density of the food which we have tested privately uh, and compared to other grocery stores it's much higher um, so we also know that our food lasts twice as long as the food in the grocery store when our members package it in their refrigerators so if it lasts longer tastes better is better for your health it probably is better for you overall absolutely and i encourage you guys always to eat locally i mean the best is of course grow your own start your own garden that's why my channel is dedicated to teach you guys how to grow your own food i have over 1700 episodes nowadays every episode is packed to show the guys and inspire you guys about growing your own food or you know of course if you don't want to grow your own food support your local micro farmer yes. and here in la well man here's the thing guys you can't even support him because he he, he can't even accommodate you because he's sold out right so tell us about the waiting list you got because i mean all your food is basically a lot allocated that's true it really is we have now 70 families or about 210 people receiving food from us every week that only adds up to about one percent of that 20,000 people in every square mile so with our three micro farms we're only scraping the surface of the need that means our micro farms, our system, and other people growing food to contribute to it need to grow and augment in order to match the real need that Los Angeles and other places like it have. And that need is so great that now our wait list is just about as long as the membership itself. What we choose to do is to prioritize people on the wait list who are in difficult situations, whether they're paying with food stamps or they are disabled or caring for a disabled family, maybe they are an at-risk at youth or they have been recently incarcerated. Whatever the case is, we bump them up to the top of the wait list and, and offer that to them first. Uh, the memberships are about $60 a month right now. Uh, for the portion that you're getting, it would cost twice or three times as much money at a Whole Foods. Cool, and then I know you're starting next your next micro farm actually at a local high school. So you wanna tell us about how many people that will serve and what else, how, how that will also benefit the community as well. That's right, well thank you. At Dorsey High School, it's a large school here in Los Angeles. We're planning to grow just about the same amount of food as here, uh, serving 45 more families over there. That will be students participating in the work in a vocational manner, learning the technical skills, the scheduling, the crop planning, the integrated pest management, the construction, the maintenance, and everything in between with soil science. So that's a lot of technical work that extends to these high school kids' curriculum, but it really extends to their entire community because now they are a resource, and there are tens and tens of them that will be resources after just one year of our operation. Uh, that's a huge transition for a school and a huge transition for a community. So we're really excited to launch that micro farm at Dorsey High School next year. Uh, it's funded by the USDA and also by the school in LAUSD, and we'll be running it through CropSwap LA. Man, if I lived in LA, that's the school I wanna go to. Can I go back to high school, man, and learn some of your stuff? Because I mean, you're literally gonna train people how to grow food, and that's gonna be a job that will always be needed. AI can take over the world and take over a lot of different jobs but people always need to eat and AI has not caught up to the level of growing food and actually having the right, you know, whatever pressure to pick a tomato without popping it and, and to do all the manual labor that it takes to grow food and more importantly, the actual intelligence because it's not just if A then B, there's so many things going on to, to grow food. So man, that sounds real cool that you're doing it at a high school and then also incorporating that to actually even feed more people in the area. Yes. So, all right, tell me this, man. I mean, <laughs> with $60 a month, you got about, you're feeding 70 families. That don't sound like a lot of money. And I know a lot of infrastructure <laughs> went into building this farm, micro farm here. And so how, how, how does the finances work, right? Is this, is this, is this model profitable or, or how do you keep this going so that you can continue your mission to feed the local people high quality food that they're not gonna be able to buy at the grocery store? Yes, it's a great question. And our model right now is not breaking even, but it is sustainable in the sense that there's other resources coming around it. There are grants being offered, politicians stepping forward to get money to our mission, and now individual donors who are supporting on their own. 
Uh, we're launching an individual giving campaign called Food Independence. And we're reaching the near the end of the year where tax season is. A lot of folks like to donate to offset their incomes. And I'm putting us out there for that reason too as a recipient of your generosity because it's such a meaningful mission. We're doing it precisely, we're doing it locally, we're hiring locally, and we're paying living wage to our staff so that they can do this and focus on the work. Otherwise, the food would die and we wouldn't be able to continue the mission. So any of your support would be grateful uh, as we continue to grow and balance this mission. Wonderful. So I know you take volunteers. I mean, that's one way people can support you guys is by volunteering some labor. And at the same time, they could actually learn some valuable skills as they're planting the food and doing the other things they would do here. They could maybe, uh, you know, send you guys a tax deductible yep. donation to help you guys out. What other ways can, you know, people, whether they live locally or even from afar, that it, and that, that they believe in this mission, that they could help you out? How else could they help you out? Oh, well, the best way to help us out where you are is start growing food on your own. Yep. That is the mission. Because once you're independent, you create independence around yourself and other resources. And if we were the ones who inspired you, great. That benefit will come back to us in some other way from the universe. Uh, but you have to do this for yourself. And like our friends are saying online, start growing your food now before crisis arrives and start storing your water as well. Rainwater is precious. It tastes better, you wash your hair with it, plants grow twice as fast with it, and it's easier to construct that, that water to do what you need it to do. Uh, so wherever you are, even if you're in a wet area, capture that water, reuse it, it becomes nutrient dense, the plants become familiar with it, and everything works better. Wow, wonderful. So are there any final words of wisdom you'd like to share with my viewers today before we sign off? Well, the only piece of wisdom I'll leave you with is a word called Ubuntu. And from Africa, it means because of you, I am. And because of me, you are. And because of us, we are. So we rely on each other environmentally. We're not in silos. And we are all kind of living in the same situation when it comes to the food industry and, you know, impending crises in the world so because of you we are and I just want to thank you in advance for your time and your generosity wonderful <laughs> so if somebody wants to get a hold of crop swap LA to maybe get on the waiting list if you guys live within a local area or learn more about your organization or how maybe one day you'll soon be franchising and doing trainings or having open house days where we could actually visit the micro farms and you do walking tours which are amazing how can they learn all about you and even, you know, maybe give some support to you guys, financial or otherwise? Yeah. Well, if you go to CropSwapLA.org or on Instagram, we're LA Crop Swap, then you'll see about the classes we're putting on, like workshops on how to grow food on your own for survival or for business. We're also putting on documentaries uh, projected in the backyard on agricultural topics. We have walking tours, we have running tours, uh, we've got yoga and all of these ways to engage all behind the mission of growing food and creating sustainability. So get involved, a volunteer with us Sunday mornings at 7 a.m. here at our headquarters. It's 3753 Degnan Boulevard. And any Sunday, even holidays, we're here. Uh, bad weather, maybe not, but we do our best to uh, hit up every Sunday, 7 to 11, and you'll be welcome to join us. Wonderful, that sounds so amazing. So yeah, if you guys live in the local area, want to spend some time i mean i would go on a walking tour for sure like absolutely like i mean i, I want to go on one of those i was reading about it and you put out like a local you know flyer regularly with updates and like how to prevent pests and organic methods and i mean you're doing a lot of great work in the community man i definitely vouch for this guy he is a wonderful man you want to check him out get involved with his organization you'll learn so much from what he's doing here in la and I hope one day man you make some kind of course so that people can, other cities could duplicate your model and we can have a micro farm on every city block. Yes. Right? Yes. That being said, man, on the other hand, I'll also say, I want to put this man out of business <laughs> because I want all you guys to take personal responsibility yes. to grow your own food. And if you went out of business because everybody was growing food and they didn't need them, he'd probably be cool with that because he'd be on vacation with me. <laughs> Nonetheless, <laughs> start growing your own food, support your local micro farms, local farmers, even farmers markets, um, you know, so start eating healthier today. And if you guys enjoyed this episode today at the Crop Swap LA micro farm here, he has two more that I haven't visited yet. <laughs> be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. 
more importantly guys share this with other people that live in the Los Angeles area so that they can learn about this amazing resource that literally sits in their backyard also be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss my new upcoming episodes I have new episodes coming out every five to seven days you never know where I'll show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel make sure you click the little bell so you get notified as my videos come out and finally be sure to check my past episodes of past episodes are a wealth of knowledge over 1700 episodes at this time on this channel dedicated to teaching guys all about how to grow your own food at home so with that my name is John Kohler with growingyourgreens.com we'll see you next time and until then remember keep on growing <laughs>